Our next workshop will be presented by Nikki Freeman and Anna Kakoska. Nikki and Anna are both located at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and Nikki is a PhD candidate in the Department of Biostatistics. And her work is focused on developing methods for precision medicine and the application of precision medicine to fra uh, framework to, the va to vascular medicine. And Anna is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition. And her main research interest is developing precision medicine approaches to improve the daily lives of people who live with diabetes. So Nikki and Anna will present the workshop, Introduction to Precision Medicine from Statistics to Society. So please welcome Nikki and Anna. So hi everyone, we are so delighted to be here with you. My name is Nikki Freeman and I am a senior doc student in the Department of Biostatistics at UNC. And my name is Anna Kikoska. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition and a KL2 scholar. And we're both in the Gilling School of Global Public Health. That's right. And today we are so excited to share with you about precision medicine and um, all the way from statistics and how to actually do empirical precision medicine to society and applying it to the real world. So we know that an hour is a really long time, and we know that there are slacks and texts and all sorts of things that might distract you. So we're just going to give you the punchline up front that precision medicine is an inherently multidisciplinary science. And in fact, I would say it's an inherent data science type of science, and that this multidisciplinary nature of it is both its challenge and its superpower. And we both believe that and we practice it. So we've both been working in this space as a multidisciplinary team. Nikki's trained as a statistician and my PhD is in nutrition with a minor in epi. And I also spent some time in the healthcare system as a medical student. So together we've ended up drawing on all of these experiences and the work that we've done together in precision medicine data science. So we have an outline for what we'd like to cover today. Um, Precision medicine can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people, and so we're going to take the time to define really clearly what we mean when we say precision medicine. And then Nikki's going to present both on the framework for statistical precision medicine and talk through some of the specific methods that we can use. And then we're going to transition and think through both opportunities and challenges for translating this kind of data science um, into clinical care and patient care. And then we'll close with some time for questions and answers. All right, so uh, precision medicine is this really big topic. We want to be really clear about what we mean when we say precision medicine, and everything else is going to build off of that. So if you don't know anything about precision medicine, that's okay. You might have heard this tagline, though, that precision medicine is finding uh, the right person for the right treatment at the right time. And you might have also seen this guy, Barack Obama, launching the Precision Medicine Initiative. And really what this was about was moving away from the one-size-fits-all approach to medicine and really thinking about patient heterogeneity, how people are different, and how can we target therapies and treatments to individuals and their individual disease status and needs. So this is just a pause to acknowledge that clinical care is by definition individualized or personalized. And care providers, no matter what discipline they're in, what kind of training they're coming from, they're always working to apply evidence to the patient in front of them. So when we say precision medicine, we are not talking about clinical care. We're talking about the process by which we generate evidence um, for that kind of care and specifically how we can use data to, um, to be more useful for those case-by-case -case decisions that providers have to make every day. So um, even as a scientific field, the term precision medicine has been used really widely to describe a lot of different work. And this is a challenge, and I think especially so when you find yourself talking to people who do different work um, that might fall under the same sort of precision medicine umbrella. So Nikki and I have been working on um, what is an overly simplified but still useful framework to try to reconcile all of that work um, and then clarify where it is that we are focused. So when I first heard about precision medicine, um, and this may be true of others here, but I was a medical student and I heard precision medicine and personalized medicine used interchangeably. And it was often in the context of genomic medicine, pharmacogenomics, and targeted immunotherapies um, in oncology, for example. And um, this is a domain of precision medicine, and it's been particularly transformative. And the reason why it works is that it relies on this really deep understanding of the disease and treatment mechanisms and the way they interact. So we need to know what's driving um, a disease process and specifically the outcome that we care about. And then we use that information to select which treatment or solution might match those drivers. 
So we're thinking about this as a sort of mechanistic approach to precision medicine in that it relies on a strong working model of diseases and drugs and their mechanisms. Sometimes we hear about precision medicine that's more focused on tailoring interventions to patients and who we know have different needs, even in the context of the same intervention. So I ran into this a lot uh, in my training in nutrition, um, and we do see it in behavioral interventions often. So it could be a diet intervention, a physical activity intervention, thinking about any sort of multi-component um, intervention, such as falls risk for older adults. And the key consideration here is that if we have a sense of what intervention, um, what the intervention should be, we can often make, make it more successful um, by making tweaks so it's matched to a specific patient's ability, their needs, and incorporating patient preferences as well. Sometimes it's used as a protocol, sometimes this relies more on professional or expert opinion, but we're calling this um, individualized uh, interventions. And um, what that means is that we're still moving away from the one size fits all, but the adaptions we're making here are relatively minor, and they're really just to ensure that the intervention itself is feasible and relevant and ideally acceptable. So distinct from those first two is this third domain of precision medicine, and um, that's the area that we're going to stay in today. And this is what I would say is a whole bucket of work um, that's taking a data-driven approach. So use, using large data sets reflective of populations, incorporating machine learning methods and artificial intelligence to search for patterns and learn directly from the data, how patients may differ from each other, and also what the implications of those differences are for optimizing their care and their health outcomes. So we're calling this empirical precision medicine. And again, the engine for this is really advanced data science, which helps us make those discoveries. And particularly when we're working in a space where we don't have a full mechanistic model or a protocol for tailoring. And that's going to be our focus today, is this type of empirical data science-driven precision medicine. All right, so last point. Even within empirical precision medicine, um, where we're focused on what we can learn from data using machine learning and AI, um, different people or stakeholders may be interested in using precision medicine data science for fundamentally different questions. And we've learned... Um, the hard way often, um, that it's worthwhile to take the time to clarify upfront really um, what the motivating problem is um, and what the goals are. So for some questions, the solution may be to understand or more precisely predict um, what will happen to somebody over time. And this is a sort of precision prognosis question, and it can look like risk stratification, it can look like phenotyping. Um, but we're really just trying to get more uh, granular predictions about prognosis. Um, for other questions, the solution may be um, a sort of uh, to predict how different people will respond to the same intervention. And this is a bit like a moderator analysis and the language we may or we use may sound like responders and non-responders. Um, the type of precision medicine that Nikki and I are interested in and most excited about is predicting what for an individual person an optimal therapy might be, given we have a set of options. And here we're using our data science tools to go beyond risk stratification and even beyond predicting what someone's intervention response might be to actually recommend what an optimal therapy is for that person. And this uh, lends itself to, uh, towards decision support. Um, for providers to determine the best action to take uh, for the patient in front of them. And so this is really where we're drilling in on the right patient, um, right treatment, right time. Okay, so we've described what we actually mean by precision medicine, but what exactly is statistical precision medicine? So I pulled this quote um, from an annual review paper by Michael Kosserock, who is our mentor at UNC, and Eric Labor, who is at Duke. And they write about statistical precision medicine, saying that it's the paradigm wherein patient heterogeneity is leveraged through data-driven approaches to improve right treatment decisions so that the right treatment is given to the right patient at the right time. And of course, when you hear that, you think, yay, that's awesome. This is exactly what I want to do. Um, but you know, then like as a statistician, I sit back and I think, but what exactly does that mean? And so we're going to take a second and, and walk through the, the mathematical framework that um, underlies this kind of statistical empirical precision medicine. 
So the place where I like to start is in causal inference. And I think it makes a lot of sense to start there. And then we'll talk about how precision medicine is different than standard causal inference. So we're going to live in this very simple world where we have a single treatment, either the zero treatment or the one treatment. That's going to be denoted by, denoted by A. We have an outcome Y that we're interested in. You know, we'll say we want to make Y big. We want to optimize it. And we're going to have some baseline patient features. This might be demographics, disease status, disease history, things like that. And then we're going to have these things called potential outcomes. And if you haven't had causal inference, that's okay. They're these very unusual beasts in statistics. So that Y with the zero inside of it, that's the outcome I would have observed had you been assigned to the zero treatment. And the Y with a one inside of it, that's another potential outcome. The outcome I would have observed had you been assigned to treatment one. And of course, we all know that, you know, we can only see one of these, right? I'm going to assign you either zero or one. I'm only going to observe one or the other. But, you know, causal inference is really built on these kinds of counterfactual questions and thinking about what happened if we'd given everyone treatment one or everyone treatment zero. And things that you might want to answer or estimate in causal inference are things like the average treatment effect. What is on average what would have happened if I treat everyone with treatment one versus what would have happened if I treat everyone with treatment zero? Or maybe the conditional average treatment effect where we look at that same difference, but for a specific subset of the population. So that's like the causal inference approach. But as precision medicine practitioners, we're interested in leveraging patient heterogeneity and making treatment decisions. And this idea of how to go from patient features to treatments is embedded in this thing called a dynamic treatment regime. And because it's a lot of words, we just say DTR. And it's a function D that maps from patient features to an action or treatment A, All right? And so you can see, we put patient features in and we're gonna get a treatment out. But of course, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're giving the right treatment to the right patient. So there's many different ways that we could assign treatments based on patient features. And we're going to assess how good a DTR is by looking at its value, the expected value of the outcomes if people were treated according to that treatment regime D. And now you know why I started in this like causal inference setting, because then it doesn't sound it's crazy to say what would have happened if I had given everyone treatments according to D. Because it's, it's, it's very much like causal inference. It's just that the treatment decision mechanism is now this DTR thing. And when we think about the right treatment, what we mean by that is we want the DTR that maximizes the value. We want to have the best outcome in the population overall if we were to apply that treatment. We are also interested in treatments over time. And so um, to kind of expand this world out, instead of thinking of a single treatment at a single time point, we can now think about what if we had multiple time points, um, one all the way to some capital K. And now we have treatment decisions that need to be made at each of those decision points. And we'll denote those by AK. We still have some outcome variable Y. And along the way, we're gonna be collecting patient history. You know, We're gonna know the baseline features, but we're also gonna know what were the past treatments and what were patients' response to those treatments? And so then our notion of a DTR expands into a sequence of functions, each one mapping from the history that we know up to that point to a treatment that's available to them at that decision point. But the idea of the value, you know, it's exactly the same. It's the, what we would, um, the value is the expected value of the response we would observe if everyone was treated according to our DTR. It's just now our DTR is a sequence. And of course, we want to find the best one, the one that optimizes outcomes overall in the population. Finally, the last thing to point out about this definition of precision medicine, you know, that when we start unpacking it, that Cosrock and Labor gave us, is that we're really interested in data-driven approaches. And so if you've read at all in the precision medicine literature, you've probably heard about Q learning or A learning or outcome-weighted learning and all the friends of outcome-weighted learning. So there's many, many data-driven approaches to this. And we're going to talk about some of these today. All right. So we kind of have seen the framework, you know, we've put it in math, what is precision medicine? Like, what do we mean when we say right treatment, right person, right time in math? But what do we actually do? Because as a data scientist, I'm really interested in like, how do I put this in my computer and learn from data? 
So before we get going on that, we need to do just a, a eensy weensy little bit of causal inference. And we're not going to spend too much time here because because that's not the point. And we're happy to point you to resources that really get into the issues. But you might have noticed that I have so far phrased everything in terms of potential outcomes. What would have happened if we had treated everyone according to some regime D? And you're thinking, but you said potential outcomes aren't always observed. At best, we're going to observe one of them. And that's absolutely right. And so we need a way to get from potential outcomes to the data that we actually observe, where we see the, pat the patient features we're collecting, we see the treatments they actually received, and we see their actual outcomes. And so we're going to need to make some assumptions um, or, you know, need to be able to assure ourselves that some things are true about our data and the way it was generated either by design or by assumption. The first one is causal consistency. And this says that if you were assigned the one treatment, then the outcome I actually observe is that potential outcome, what I would have observed if you had been assigned the one treatment. And it sounds like a tautology, but there are cases where that's actually not obviously true. The second thing that we need is positivity, and this makes sense that we need the probability of each action for each particular history needs to be greater than zero. We need some variety of treatments for people with the same histories in our data set. If we don't have that, there's not really anything to learn from it. Finally, we need sequential ignorability. And if you've had causal inference, this is just the uh, K time point extension of the known measures confounder assumption um, that, you, that you might be familiar with. And this just says that the potential outcomes uh, are independent of the treatment assignments. Okay. So now, if you believe me that we either can assume these assumptions or by design, like in a SMART trial, that we have positivity and sequential ignorability, we can actually do um, some learning of these DTRs. So I'm going to present three different approaches. And it, there are so many approaches and there's so many ways that we could do this, but there's kind of three different flavors of what people are doing. And these are very plain vanilla ways. So the first strategy is we're going to uh, estimate that value function, the expected value of the outcomes if everyone had been uh, treated according to regime D. And then once we can estimate the value for any particular regime, we can just search around in a class of regimes and then find the one that gives me the highest value. And then that's my optimal regime. So how are we going to estimate the value? Well, one very straightforward way is to use a Horvitz-Thompson type estimator. And this guy looks, you know, maybe a little intimidating, but this is just a weighted mean. That very special looking P that just says take the average um, and we're averaging over outcomes. And that C thing that just says for people that are consistent with a particular regime. So if your treatment sequence actually happens to coincide with what the dynamic treatment regime D would have given you, then you're going to get included. And then the denominator is just upweighting those individuals by the probability of receiving the sequence that they would have received. Some people call this the inverse probability of treatment weighting estimator as well. So don't get hung up on terminology. I, I call the second one, this more high take estimator is the IPTW type. I call it IPTW just because it's a little bit more common um, how people would actually do it in practice. Um, you might have heard this if you've read like Hernan and Robbins, like this is stabilized IPTW or normalized IPTW. And it's the exact same thing, except for we just normalize the weights. Because if you've ever done any weighting, you know that weights can get very unwieldy very quickly. And this kind of little stabilization term, that thing that's on the left-hand side in front of the, what, the Horvitz-Thompson estimator, that just makes sure that things don't go too far awry. And then the other way that we could estimate this value function, we might could do something like AIPTW, Augmented Inverse Probability of Treatment Weighting. And again, this looks a little, you know, like, oh, what's going on there? But we're really just averaging over that Horvitz-Thompson estimator. And we're taking a combination of it. And you see that Q function in the right-hand side. That's a conditional mean model. So we've modeled the response and we have this weighted version of it. And we're just taking a combination of the two and averaging over that. And the, the great thing about this augmented um, inverse probability treatment weighting approach is that it achieves the um, it's semi-parametric efficient. So if you've had any semi-parametric efficiency theory or you've heard of like doubly robust, this guy satisfies it. 
Whew. All right, so we know how to estimate the value for a particular regime. How do we find the best one? Well, what we might do is we might define a class of regimes that we're interested in. I wrote a super simple one here. So I just said, let the regime be the indicator function that if your X1, so you know your blood pressure is greater, well, I guess blood pressure is not between zero and 20, but some, some feature is greater than beta one, then we treat you. And if not, then we don't treat you. And then what we would do is we would just, you know, estimate the value for all the different regimes that correspond to these betas and the one that leads to the highest value, that's the optimal dynamic treatment regime. All right, so that's one flavor. Estimate the value and then search over uh, a class of regimes. Another strategy that you might have heard of if you've been around precision medicine, and this is a very popular approach, is Q-learning. Um, and you've probably heard of Q-learning if you have any experience in, in reinforcement learning as well. So this is using finite horizon off-policy reinforcement learning, which is a type, and we're going to use a type of approximate dynamic programming. And the algorithm itself is a consequence of the Bellman equation and works via backwards recursion. And so I'm going to just demonstrate this or kind of walk through like the steps you would take in a two-stage problem, as opposed to, you know, getting really deep into, you know, Bellman equations and all those kinds of things. So the first thing that you might want to know about Q learning is, well, what is Q? Well, that's referring to something called the Q function. And at each time point, we have a Q function. And it's just a conditional mean, the expected value of the outcome Y, conditional on the history up to that point, and the actions at that point. So in a two-stage setting, we're going to work backwards. We're going to start at the second stage. And so what we might do is we might posit a model for our uh, stage two Q function. And remember, this Q function is just a conditional mean. So we could use something like plain regression, or we could do something fancier. And then we're going to estimate our model using the observed outcomes that we see in our data set. Then we're going to work recursively. But whenever we go to do the stage one Q model, instead of using Y, we're going to use something called a pseudo value, where we take the Q, the stage two Q function that we've estimated, and we assume that everyone got the optimal treatment at stage two. That predicted value for Y, that's our pseudo value. And that's going to be the response in our stage one, let's say, regression model to estimate the first stage Q function. So, you know, we've worked backwards, um, we start at the end, we've kind of done the same process of estimating Q functions. You know, you could see pretty easily how you could expand this to, to more stages. At the end of the day, you're gonna get out an optimal dynamic treatment regime. And it is precisely those actions that optimize each of these Q functions along the way. All right, so previous way, what we did is we estimated the value function and we did a search. Here, we're going backwards recursively, looking at each of the stage decisions and estimating conditional mean models. There's a third kind of flavor of learning optimal dynamic treatment regimes that I wanted to talk about today, and that's outcome-weighted learning. And the idea here, and this was super like groundbreaking revolutionary when this work came out, it was to convert an, the optimal dynamic treatment regime learning problem into a machine learning problem, and in fact, into a weighted classification problem. So let's look at the single stage setting, and let's imagine that we have a binary treatment, and we code it as negative one and one. And then the value of a regime can be written as I have it here on the slide. And this is just our friend, the, the Horvitz-Thompson estimator. This is just a weighted mean. Um, and we know that, you know, we just need to optimize over the treatment regimes, and that's the best um, treatment rule, you know, based on the data that we have. But by magic, patience, and algebra, uh, you know, people showed, Zhao et al. in 2012 showed that uh, you could actually rewrite this um, in the way that I've highlighted here. And, and if you look at it, this is just a classification problem. And what we're trying to do is just minimize the classification error. And once you convert the problem into that, it's just a machine learning problem. And it opens up the entire universe of machine learning classification algorithms to solve and search for optimal dynamic treatment regimes. And this is really special because before we were estimating the value and then kind of we had to like posit a class of models or posit a class of regimes or the regimes were kind of implicit because we were estimating a Q function and then the regime just kind of fell out of it. But here we're directly looking for regimes and that's something super special and unique about outcome weighted learning. And there's a lot of theory that's been developed about this as well. All right. 
So that's three flavors of how to find optimal dynamic treatment regimes. There are many other methods and settings and things that we didn't talk about. There's marginal structural models and G estimation and regret-based learning and interactive key learning and how, you know, the outcome weighted learning, I showed you a single stage, but there's like multiple stages and all these other extensions to it um, that we didn't get to talk about, but we'll make those available um, when these slides go out with other resources for this type of work. We looked at a finite time horizon, but there's a, a body of work for indefinite time horizon setting precision medicine problems. Uh, we didn't talk about how to get data that's like really optimally designed for doing precision medicine. So you might have heard of SMART trials, which is one way to generate data for precision medicine. Um, SMART stands for sequential multiple assignment randomization trial. And the other thing is mHealth. mHealth is nearly ubiquitous. It's all over the place, super exciting, super buzzy, and these just-in-time adaptive interventions that are using this like online learning, reinforcement learning type things uh, to, to text people and ping them and remind them to do good, healthy behaviors at the right time. So that's a lot. <laughs> We've done the, you know, we're statistics to society. That's statistics. Uh, we're going to shift gears towards society, but I wanted to pause here just in case there's like any burning questions before we move on to the society part. All good? A Anna's looking at the questions. It looks good. All right. Awesome. Everyone's along with us. All right, so now we're going to transition um, away from some of the math to talk about what are the opportunities for how we might use um, this kind of data science. So that brings us to a conversation about translation. And there are a lot of different definitions of translation and different frameworks. Um, this is a definition from the um, National Center for Advancing Translational Science that I really like. And they define translation as the process of turning observations in the laboratory, clinic, or community into interventions that improve the health, health of individuals and the public from diagnostics and therapeutics to medical procedures and behavior changes. So I like this definition, first of all, because it calls out a process, which to me says this is multi-step, this is iterative, and it's ongoing. Um, I also like that it focuses on observations without being overly specific about where they're coming from or how they're generated. So I think often um, we're used to thinking about this process in the context of moving research from the bench to the bedside, um, but this definition is wide enough to um, accommodate what we learn through data science, and in this case, precision medicine, statistical methods, and thinking through how those are turned into interventions to actually improve health. So the question here is, if we have an optimal DTR, how can we use that model and all of the information that it encodes to actually improve patient care or other community-based health services? One way that this could look, of many, um, is that that DTR is actually developed into a clinical decision support tool. And that would be a tool that was meant to aid providers or community health workers, um, depending on the setting, to select optimal individualized treatments for the person right in front of them. So you might consider an outpatient clinical setting, which is what this picture is trying to get you to um, think about. So assume we have a DTR that's trained on data representative of the patients that are seen in that clinic. This tool could be integrated directly into the EHR. Um, it could pull uh, relevant patient information from the medical record system and then use that information to recommend an optimal treatment. And this recommendation could be discussed by the provider and the patient as part of a shared decision-making process. Um, I think it's worth emphasizing here um, that these precision medicine analytics, we don't see these as replacing the human aspect of um, medicine. Um, these models are not meant to be deterministic, and even the ones that we may have the most confidence in are still really only meant to provide more granular and useful information um, for shared decision making between providers and patients. So Nikki and I are really interested in this topic because we think at scale, integrating DTRs into clinical care could be really impactful um, for a couple different reasons. The first one is fairly obvious. Um, our DTRs are designed to optimize outcomes by selecting a treatment for each person that we think will work best based on their information. 
So if we can actually deliver on those recommendations, we would expect to improve clinical outcomes both at the individual level, but then um, if we do it over and over again at the population level, because everyone would, would be getting their optimal treatment. Um, related to that, um, it could be that this improves patient experiences. So people may spend less time um, um, being assigned to interventions that don't work for them. We could decrease frustration associated with um, adhering to those suboptimal interventions. Um, depending on how we structure the outcomes in the DTR, we might design these models to actually minimize side effects or off-target effects. Um, and overall, we could just be decreasing the time to benefit or time to relief. And then lastly, um, if we really are matching the right treatment to the right patient at the right time, um, we would expect to both increase resource and cost effectiveness from the perspective of the healthcare system. So despite um, all, of, all of those opportunities, um, we know that to date, precision medicine data science hasn't really been translated to overhaul clinical or community care. And um, this is an essay that was published in JAMA in 2020 by a group out of Vanderbilt, Dr. Lenzel and his colleagues. And um, I picked this quote because I think it really highlights the gap between the number of new algorithms and data science models um, compared to um, any change to how providers are actually making decisions in clinical or community practice. And then a second essay, and it's actually from 2016, um, but I think it points out why, why that's a problem, which is that um, it creates a feedback loop where we don't really have translation happening. That lack of translation is actually impeding further translation because we don't have any evidence to drive the process forward. Okay, so now, you know, we want to invite you to um, help us think about what are some of the challenges for translating precision medicine data science. Um, and this is where everyone here as data scientists can really help us understand and bring their perspective to the how we think about precision medicine out in the wild. So we have a couple interactive uh, slides coming up, but this is the framework that we're going to use, and it's the one I just presented. But say we have our model on the left, and we want to use it to improve health on the right, and we're specifically going to try to deploy it as part of a clinical decision support tool for use in an outpatient uh, clinical office, doctor's office. Um, so our question for um, the audience is, what other information do um, we need for stakeholders to adopt and actually use our data-driven uh, precision medicine decision support tool. And I think Valerie is going to drop in the chat a link. There it is. Okay. I see it. The link to this question. And so you should be able to go to this link and answer, uh, put in your answer to this question. And fingers crossed, it'll actually populate <laughs> on our screen. <laughs> We should have thought about music for this intro or something. <laughs> yes. Is our slide working? Oh. Ooh, trust. I love that. I think there's there's a lot of ways that we could think about trust, mm -hmm. like trusting the algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, I think that also gets into like bias and fairness and equity. There's just like a lot of issues around, around trust, especially if you don't understand the analytics. That's right. I think data security, that's, that's a big one. And at least in the sort of um, like national and international conferences I've been at recently, um, that is an open question about how we balance the need to um, have as much data as possible and particularly representative data with the need to ensure um, that individuals' privacy uh, is protected. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like this multi-conditions one. I think, you know, very often in clinical research, you're very focused on this very specific problem. And, you know, we have two or three treatments and we need to find, you know, which one's better or not. Um, but very often, you know, these patients, they're not just this one problem. They're a, a whole array of problems. And Anna's like a national expert on diabetes. She is amazing. And, you know, those patients have a lot I was going to say older adults. Older adults. They're thinking through, yeah, mm -hmm. as people get older, they develop multimorbidity. That's absolutely a consideration. Yeah. What else? Context. I think that's great. Absolutely. Context is so important. Ease of understanding results. Oh, do we need to scroll? We're getting so many answers. I love this. 
<laughs> we have a very precarious setup here. <laughs> There's a couple answers here that uh, speak to interpretability. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Oh, okay. Oh, no. Fair enough. We're, we're just not going to touch it because it's scrolling for us. All right, go on, interpretability. No, I just see I see being interpretable both for clinicians and also for patients to understand why that algorithm uh, made the recommendation that it did. Yeah, and I think that goes, you know, this one about overriding. Ooh, this moving is, is a lot. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if it's moving for everyone else, but it's scrolling for us. Cool. Yeah, I think this is great. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. We really appreciate having lots of people to ideate with us because, you know, there's a lot of things to think about. There's a lot of context um, to bring in. And, you know, we certainly believe that this is a multidisciplinary sport. You know, it's a team sport, precision medicine, and, and having people's own lived experiences um, is really, really beneficial. It also would have been painful if nobody participated. We really appreciate you <laughs> participating. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. So, you know, all of this translation stuff might feel really distant from what might would be like in a job description for a data scientist. Um, but I think, you know, most of the people here on this call in this workshop know that the role of the data scientist is more than just modeling and programming and data wrangling and database building, that data scientists have this vital leadership role um, on the teams that they work in. And that's because we're trying to help people come to the best design and the best decisions with their data. And I think this is particularly true in precision medicine because it is this fundamentally data science enterprise. And so, you know, I think if you're thinking about like, what's the role of data scientist in all this translation stuff, like we understood why the math and, you know, these algorithms, why you, why you talked about them, but why are you talking about all this? And it's because I think, you know, the role here for the data scientist is to bring statistical leadership, as Eric Gibson put it in his 2019 paper in the American Statistician. And he says it's the use of influence to guide a multidisciplinary research team to adopt the best designer decisions based on the available data. And I just love this idea that as data scientists, our job is to do modeling and programming and thinking about the data, but it's also to use our influence um, within this larger team to really try to improve health when we're thinking about precision medicine. And I would add that um, strong statistical leadership, it sets up other people on the team who may have less technical training. So for example, Nikki has a lot of technical training. I have less, but that strong leadership sets other people up to contribute in um, their most effective way possible. And particularly as our data sources become richer and we move towards linking different sources together, I think there's a lot to be gained from thinking creatively and broadly but there has to be this model of leadership that bridges from um, non-statistical team members and specifically their questions, their thoughts to the reality of the data, uh, as well as the statistical tools that are available. And then continuously I, uh, um, kind of working between those technical considerations and then um, what it is that we really care about. And that process, I think, will ensure that our precision medicine data science stays problem-driven. And in doing so, we also make sure we have a clear path to transmission. All right, so we have one more interactive slide where we're going to ask you to help us out. Um, and, you know, as data scientist leaders, you know, imagine yourself as a, as a leader in precision medicine, what other disciplines might we need to engage for translating precision medicine models to care? And you can think back to all the information um, that came up on the previous slide as well. Still, Still the awkward pause. Ooh, psychology, absolutely. Behavior and just... I think there's a, a lot to be said for, um, there's a lot of change that has to happen for these um, clinical decision support tools to, um, to really see the light of day. Um, and so I think thinking about psychology, both of patients as well as providers is um, really important. Anyone else? <laughs> Ooh, implementation science. Absolutely. I think that the sooner that we can um, integrate implementation science theories, constructs, 
um, the better set up we are to be thinking towards the specific setting where we're deploying these tools. Absolutely. I think nursing and medicine, absolutely, you know, having, and I think this goes back to the idea of trust that we had in the previous question, but having buy-in and trust with clinicians that are actually going to be the people deploying these tools in the wild is so essential. Um, and bringing them into the conversation early and often mm -hmm. is, is really important for translation. It's really an allied health science. You know, I think I've used the word uh, clinic and clinician a lot, but referring broadly to providers. Um, so there's actually a very active precision dentistry movement happening at UNC right now. And so I think this is really an allied health um, effort. Yep. I think ethics, you know, I think things can get very tricky when we're thinking about different treatments for different people and being very careful um, about our models and how they work. Um, and what are the downstream effects of deploying them in the wild and making sure that we're not, you know, with, with really good intentions in our heart, um, leading to really bad, unethical, um, inequitable outcomes. What else? I'm seeing information security. I think that's a mm -hmm. beautiful way to close that loop earlier about uh, make, make, making sure that people's data stays private. Yep, absolutely. Environmental studies and GIS. I think, you know, that's something that me and you really haven't thought too much about. Yeah. But, you know, certainly environment, climate um, is, is really, really important. And especially, you know, we've seen just in the last couple of years how much climate affects health. Um, and like, what does that mean for being able to put a DTR out into the world? Or is it even meaningful if, you know, we have all these climate disasters happening? So I, I think that's a really important point. Lovely. All right. So this is a slide that we made before this talk, which is now thoroughly inadequate compared to um, <laughs> all of the thoughts from the audience. Um, but we've been thinking through um, who we see as our kind of main contributors to precision medicine outside of statistics um, and listed some of those here. So to close, um, we also wanted to highlight some of our early work trying to uh, actually operationalize this multidisciplinary approach. And so um, there are a lot of challenges, there are a lot of open questions, which um, everyone here pointed out really nicely. But one thing I think we know to be true is um, that real world um, patient care, either in a clinical or community setting, is just a lot more complex than the individualized treatment framework that Nikki presented. So um, for starters, care is more um, involves more than a single treatment decision. Um, and we also know that health outcomes are shaped by many multi-level factors, the majority of which are not actually individual, but structural, such as racism. And there's also social and behavioral and environmental factors, um, in addition to the biological or clinical factors that are easier to measure. And all of these factors interact in ways that are really difficult to predict um, or, or account for. So we recently wrote, wrote this essay that basically makes a call to include this complexity awareness as part of our evidence generation process. So to move towards a, uh, a data science that is designed to deliver on that tagline of uh, right treatment, right patient, right time, but also consider patients in their specific context. And here are some examples of the types of questions that I think we can and should be asking as data scientists and their collaborators um, to really prime our models to work within these complex systems. So, you know, yes, people are different from each other, but there are also the multiple and interrelated determinants of health outcomes that I referenced. Um, we also know that there are pretty serious constraints, um, both at the individual level and at the healthcare system level and often competing care priorities. Um, so these are some big questions, and they, at the very least, should uh, help underscore why we think this is a true team sport. All right, so we just want to make sure that we thank people before we get to questions. Um, we're thankful to have funding. We're thankful to our mentor. So Michael Kosrock, um is a biostatistician. He's a real leader in the field of precision medicine, and he has given us a lot of um, support and empowered us to really go forward with the vision of what precision medicine could be. 
And Kristen hasmiller Lich um, is also at UNC, and she's helped us to really think through how we can infuse some of this complexity awareness um, into our data science. And of course, we want to thank uh, women in data science and the committee for just being wonderful, wonderful shepherds for us as we've gone through this process of getting ready for this workshop and, you know, helping us with, with technical issues and giving us ideas and suggestions. Um, it's been a really great experience, and we're really happy to, um, to be here and to do this. Great. All right. So any questions? Great. Well, thank you both so much for that workshop. That was so interesting and fun, and the, the interactive slides were really great. Um, I think that I'll start off with one question in the chat, but I really encourage everyone to submit other questions. Um, so Alan asks, is it possible to have a database with algorithms on pregnancies to know how many babies will be born and be sure that they will grow up in a safe environment? Um, I'm not exactly sh sure about, you know, I think you can do predictive modeling about, you know, birth rates and things like that. And so like, that's a topic of demography. Um, what I think is, is very exciting though, kind of in this maternal fetal health space is, you know, there's a couple of projects that I've worked on where they're looking at birth outcomes um, in low resource settings and thinking about how to apply precision medicine to those settings where, um, maybe not all the treatments are available all the time, um, where there's not great uh, antenatal care um, or prenatal care. Um, and then also looking at women of reproductive age as they move into pregnancy and thinking about how can we better allocate more precisely meet their needs. And so I think there's a lot of space related to maternal fetal health for precision medicine. And it, it, they may not actually get to this idea of, a, a, you know, are they gonna grow up in a safe environment, but how can we make that pregnancy period, how can we make those early years really safe and direct interventions to babies that and mothers that need them? And I can jump on and just say, I read that question, I immediately think about data linkage. So I think that we will have, you know, the, the more data we can be linking together, so clinical data potentially with um, claims, with uh, environmental data, we'll have resources, at least data resources, with which we can answer these really complex questions that kind of combine clinical and environmental uh, measures. Great. Um, and I'm curious as far as precision medicine um, on as like who will have access to it? I guess a big question is like, if it's really um, intensive care or something, maybe uh, some groups of people, maybe more well-off people might have more access to it than others. What are your thoughts on that? So I think that is one of the biggest questions uh, when we think forward to translation is how, you know, how can we make that translation um, as equitable as possible? Um, I think there are going to be opportunities to incorporate equity into every step. And so um, the setting is obviously important, um, but I think even taking one step back and thinking to what are the data that we're requiring for DTRs and, you know, is it possible for everybody to have that data collected or what's the cost of that kind of data collection, which may push us in some cases to be using more accessible data, potentially at the expense of the performance of the model. But if we can be using this in real time on more people, um, then I think you know that's a trade-off that's worth making. Great. Well, I think that that might relate a little bit to the next question from Anne, who's asking about people who maybe interact with chatbots rather than health practitioners and whether um, that data might be usable for precision medicine. Maybe there'd be a lower barrier to entry there. I think that there is a huge move towards text-based interventions and thinking about how to apply precision medicine principles to it. Um, some of that is like in the in-health sphere, um, sphere, thinking about how can we get the right messages and the right frequency and duration of those messages to people. Um, but I think there's a lot more to do there. There's a lot more methods development. And in terms of what's actually been tested out in the field, um, has, is, you know, it's a really small number of interventions so far. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for that, but certainly it's, it's possible and people are thinking about that. Okay, great. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I'm seeing another question about how 
um, whether you can expand on how the complex systems approach is different from how precision medicine is currently done. Um, so people might think of complex systems as kind of like, you know, modeling climate change and things like that. So how is it being applied to precision medicine? So I do think we can be using it as a modeling approach for our problem understanding in precision medicine. Um, so one thing that the systems approach and systems thinking brings is the um, ability to more holistically represent both the factors that we think are impacting outcomes and maybe multiple outcomes and how they're related. So I think we can be using systems thinking and systems modeling kind of in the front end of our process to make sure we really clearly understand um, our disease setting, our population, all of the factors that are going into the outcomes. And then we design our interventions to, um, to be you know, working at the sort of highest leverage point. Um, I think another thing that complex systems lends itself to is thinking longitudinally. Um, and specifically thinking about longitudinal outcomes that may not be linear um, or may have feedback loops or have these sort of time delays. And so again, I think if we do really careful problem understanding um, and we have you know, a sort of a model of the complexity, but also how that complexity plays out over time, um, then we're able to also be doing our precision medicine in that longitudinal framework um, that Nikki described and make sure we're evaluating maybe what we need to be evaluating at the at the right time. And I would just add, I think something really smart that Anna told me a couple of years ago, and it's always stuck with me, is that whenever you deploy a precision medicine tool into the real world, you're, you're not just affecting that patient and that provider, but you're really changing the entire system and the way that you're thinking about how to treat patients. And this affects their caregivers, this affects, you know, their transportation needs or their childcare needs. And so there's all these other levels and layers of things that affect the how efficiently and how well we can do precision medicine out in the world. And so being able to use system science and this complex systems modeling, um, which Anna is brilliant at and, and a beautiful thinker about, um, really helps you to make your precision medicine more context specific and you know really try to find ways to make it efficient um, and really optimize it. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, great to hear about that. And I would also recommend everyone, we still have some more time for questions, so keep putting your questions in the chat. And we can next move on to a question. Um, has there been any work using precision medicine for preventative care? So I'm going to say yes, certainly. It's not my area of expertise. Um, I know that um, at UNC, there's actually a, a precision public health um, working group and it's based out of UNC. It's actually a multi-institution collaboration, but um, there's a lot of work and a lot of writing on um, what is precision public health versus precision medicine, where are their overlaps, where are their differences. And so um, absolutely, I think um, we are, there's work that takes this concept of precision medicine, but is moving it into a preventative intervention space. And also rather than working at the level of the individual, working at the level of the, um, of the community. So being more interested in subpopulations, subgroups, um, rather than you know everything being within this individualized treatment decision framework. Um, very cool. Um, and we have another question, which um, is, where can people find your work if they're interested? Um, this will be recorded also to answer the other second part of the question. We'll send out the recordings next week, but if people are interested in reading more about your work, where can they find it? Well, there's PubMed. Um, <laughs> we've talked about building a website for a long time. We, our next slide, we have a lab website um, and we'll put our email, yeah, we'll um, put our email up. So I, I know we, um, you know, we're, we're early in this work, and so we'd love to hear from people directly um, if they have thoughts or um, want to work in this space together. It's something where um, we're looking to engage more collaborators. Great. Hopefully people will get in contact. Um, we have another question, which is, how do you think precision medicine will change the current prescription drug industrial complex? Anna, that's a question for you. <laughs> I wish I could ask this person what they mean by um, prescription drug industrial complex. Um, my 
gut tells me that um, industry in general, I think, is also really interested in this topic of precision medicine. I think um, it really serves everybody to be more precisely delivering drugs to the patients for whom it's going to work. Um, so I actually think this is an area that's um, really ripe for collaboration between academia and research and industry. Um, but again, I'm not sure if I'm answering that question directly. Okay, great. Well, everyone, and feel free to clarify in the chat. Um, but so another question is kind of how do you see yourself? Do you see yourselves as domain experts, statisticians, data engineers? Um, how do you define your expertise and how it fits in with your research? So I'll go first so Anna can think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm I'm pretty squarely a, a biostatistician. You know, that's my training. Um, before I came to biostatistics, I was in economics. So I, you know, uh, have a master's in economics as well. And so I, I tend to have these like flavors of social science and kind of the way I think and approach the world. But I definitely come to it, you know, from a statistics lens. Um, and I think one nice thing about being in biostatistics is, and particularly at UNC, because, you know, UNC has this reputation for, for being a theory school, and that is true, but we also have these wonderful relationships with the med school and the dentistry school and the nursing school. And so you really get to meet domain experts and you yourself start to really kind of take on some of that knowledge um, in a really deep and meaningful way. So I'm a statistician, um, interested in a lot of things. But, you know, certainly my work has veered towards very specific domains, so like vascular disease or maternal fetal health. And I similarly have been focused in domains. I Most of my work is in diabetes research, and more recently I've gotten into um, older adulthood and how diabetes care and management changes in older adulthood. Um, I think of my most aspirational, I would uh, say I would like to be a population health scientist. Like I really um, am interested in how we can improve the health of population. So there's certainly um, components of domain expertise and there are components of data science. Like I think the thinking through how we generate evidence um, for you know, both individual decision-making as well as policy um, decision-making that's more oriented towards population. But um, yeah, I would say ideally, you know, catch me in 10 years and I will definitely be a population health scientist. <laughs> But we're both data scientists. Yeah. I think we're both, you know, we're big tent precision medicine people. Like we think precision medicine, there's room for a lot of different approaches. And that's why we spent so much time trying to say like, this is the precision medicine, the, the little kernel that we're working on, but there's this whole world out there. And I think it's the same about data science that, you know, we really want to use data to improve health. And, you know, we come at it at really different ways and different skill sets. But I think that's, you know, what makes this, you know, work relationship work is that we have um, different skills and different points of view that strengthens all the things that we do together. Great. Yeah, it's so cool how you're integrating so many different fields. Um, I think we have one last audience question, um, which is pretty interesting. So basically, if you're using past data, then is there a way that whatever precision medicine solutions you're prescribing will be influenced by previous solutions. Like maybe there have been like a hundred drug interventions and one like other kind of intervention. So you're probably gonna end up like recommending a drug intervention just because of like what's been done more in the past. I think it's, it, it definitely depends on what are the available treatments. Um, and so there is that, like what actually exists out in the world. So, you know, using data to learn about how to match treatments and patients, um, we very much depend on those treatments existing. We're not finding new treatments. So I think from that point of view, yes, we do, you know, it does depend on the history and what actually exists. And I would just point out, I think this is what makes this field of data science really complex is these are not like models that we are running once, putting in a table, publishing, and never looking at again, like these really are meant to be, um, to provide decision support. And so I think there will be opportunities to be updating those models as new treatments become available, for example, um, and uh, as we get more information from evaluation. Um, so I think it's a great question and it kind of points to um, why this is so complex is because this is really, you know, ideally going to be an iterative sort of living um, algorithm. 
Great. Well, thank you so much for presenting.